Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Diane Dahoney. I'm the Community Service Librarian at the Paul Sawyer Public Library. And we would like to welcome you to another virtual event. Uh, we're so glad for you to come out and join us tonight. Last month, we were lucky enough to have uh, Nora Salam from the Frankfurt Audubon Society to present a program on backyard bird identification. And it was such a hit um, that everybody was clamoring for more bird programming. Um, everybody's really excited for spring, I think. Um, and the Frankfurt Audubon Society was so kind to join us again this month with another wonderful presentation, this time on hummingbirds, their life history and backyard tips. So I know you're going to learn a lot tonight. Uh, we, uh, as I said, we're very uh, grateful to have the Frankfurt Audubon Society partnering with us on this event tonight. We have Noor Salam as our presenter, and uh, Lisa Gabbard is going to be um, helping run the event and uh, do some chat uh, chat features and, and putting some questions in for everyone a little bit later during the presentation. So stay tuned for that. Um, as you are logging in, of course, feel free to turn your camera on if you would like, or you can leave it off. That's totally your preference. We do ask that you would keep your microphone muted um, while our speaker is presenting until it's the appropriate time for questions. And then you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and um, ask Noor your hummingbird questions. Um, we are recording this program tonight for educational purposes, uh, so just want to let you know about that. Um, but beyond that, uh, just thank you again on behalf of the library for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to Noor Salam of the Frankfurt Audubon Society. Welcome, Noor. Thank you so much, Diane, and I'm so glad everyone here was able to join and that they are just as excited about hummingbirds as I am. And we're going to talk so much about them today, and we're going to make sure that you have everything you need so that you can attract them to your backyard. So let's get started. Before we dive in, uh, I want to make sure that you're able to engage with us. We want to hear from you. We want to hear your questions. We'll do our best. And with, with the great help of Lisa, we'll do our best to, um, you know, answer them. So make sure that you look at the bottom of your screen and use the chat feature and type your messages on the right. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. All right. So when we say hummingbirds in Kentucky, we're talking about mainly the ruby-throated hummingbird. They are the only species of hummingbird that is commonly present and breeding in Kentucky. There are two uh, other hummingbirds that have been seen that we'll talk about, but they're extremely rare. So this is the almost exclusive species that you'll find in, in the wilds and in Kentucky. Amazingly, the oldest known humming, ruby-throated hummingbird was nine years old. That fascinates me just thinking about it. They weigh about one-tenth of an ounce, and those little jewels of the sky beat their wings 53 times per second. I'm going to say it again, 53 times per second, not per minute, per second, which is mind-blowing. They can consume 50% of their weight in sugar every day without gaining weight. So you can tr just imagine how much energy they spend beating their wings and just being active all, all, day, all day long. Well, first of all, we want to answer the most burning question this spring and every spring. When do the hummingbirds come to Kentucky? So they usually overwinter in Central America. And as you can see in the below map, the blue part is where they spend the winter. They then fly over the Gulf of Mexico and migrate north to spend the, the, sum, the spring summer and fall in North America and in Canada as well. They migrate during the day 
and they, they don't migrate in groups, unlike other birds. They migrate alone. The earliest known arrival of a season to Kentucky is March 28th, which means they're already here. So um, they're, they're well, at the time of this presentation, there has been sightings all over Kentucky, all the way up to Northern Kentucky in uh, near Cincinnati, the Cincinnati metropolitan area. Those hummingbirds hang around longer than you'd think. So they start coming here at the very, very, very end of March, mostly in April. They stay, they stay quite a bit into the fall and the latest known sighting of a hummingbird in, in a season in Kentucky is actually November 30th, which might be surprising to some people. This year, uh, the first one that was seen in Kentucky was March, in March 30th in McCreary County. And I was able to obtain this information using ebird.org. And if you're very eager to see hummingbirds, all you have to do is go into ebird.org and type in ruby-throated hummingbird and then check the current year of observations. And every time you'll check them every week, you'll see sightings moving northward every time you check. So by now, you'll when you look at Kentucky, you'll see sightings all over, which is really exciting because they, they are here and they are thriving. Let's talk about feeding. We all know that they feed on the nectar of flowers, but did you know that they also eat insects? I'm gonna show you a video right here that will, will maybe get you to learn something new about them. So they will feed on insects that uh, maybe in the spider webs of some, uh, of some spiders. But what you're seeing in this video here is a hummingbird trying to eat the insects that are inside the little holes created by a sapsucker. So for those of you who don't know what a sapsucker is, it's a type of woodpecker. And there's actually a little woodpecker in the hole that you're seeing in this tree. And this sapsucker has created a lot of little areas in this tree where they can retrieve the sap. And so that's what the hummingbird is after. They're after the insects found inside those little holes. So they're actually super smart and very resourceful in this in this way. Now, moving on, uh, I want to talk about their nests. They're also amazing. They are extremely small. They're two inches in diameter, two inch, about maximum two inches in height. Hummingbirds will not only use um, spider webs to pick off little insects sometimes, but they will also take some of the spider silk and weave it into their nests. What this does is it allows the nest to stretch as the young chicks grow. So there's a bit of elasticity in, in the nest. And usually there are two, one to two eggs laid in, in one clutch of eggs. And um, the, when males and females mate, they don't um, actually stay together, the, the male goes on to, to other quests and the female usually tends to the nest alone, which is, which is different from maybe other birds that you, you've heard about. Let's look at uh, a little video of their nests. So here you see two very small chicks and look at the little uh, lichen leaves on the nest. And if you look really closely, you can also see little pieces of spider silk uh, at the very top right that are kind of going around the nest. And uh, that's, that's what a hummingbird nest looks like. It's quite fascinating. Okay. Now, after the chicks grow up, they, they turn into what we call fledglings, which is the stage right after uh, being what they're called chicks. After they move on from the fledgling stage, they become just immature birds. For males, we all know that males have ruby-throated humming, hummingbird males have this beautiful 
red throat? Well, they don't just get that instantly. As they grow, they get more gorget feathers. So these gorget feathers are the little red iridescent feathers on their throats. And so this bird here is immature because they don't have a full gorget. So this is something that's gradual. And when you look at a bird, it's indicative of how old they are. Obviously, females don't have gorgets. So the female ruby-throated hummingbirds have white throats. All right, the most, the most interesting part for me. So you may already know this, but males defend their, their territories very, very aggressively. And before we watch this very, very interesting behavior, I wanna say that uh, if you preserve this at your feeders, it is possible to reduce the level of aggression. Aggression, Obviously this is a natural phenomenon and we shouldn't interfere much with birds' behavior between amongst themselves. But if there's extreme aggression on your feeders, it means that you may have too large of a feeder with too many points and a good idea uh, for reducing aggression is to have small feeders that are dispersed on your property. And that way you benefit as well because you can see them from different windows instead of having them all in the same place. Let's check out what those birds can do to each other. And just before we watch this video, this video has more than the ruby-throated hummingbird uh, species in it. So just know that those are not all ruby-throated hummingbirds. What's great about this video is that it's in slow motion and you'll see some real good action in here. On the left, you see a hummingbird fanning its tail feathers, and that's also a territorial display. So now that you know that there are little troublemakers, let's talk more about this behavior that we just saw. Ornithologists have studied these flight patterns extensively. And um, on the left here uh, is one category of, of display. So they, they've categorized all of these flights and it's called the pendulum arc flight. And it's known to be used for uh, territor territorial defense, as well as maybe courting the females. Actually, most of these 
uh, patterns that I'm going to talk about are it's undecided whether they're just for territorial defense or for courtship as well. So it's there's really so much to learn still about hummingbirds and their behavior. We have also vertical flight. So the hummingbirds will kind of fly in front of each other, sometimes one um, opposite to the other. And, and this is also courtship and or territorial behavior. And then we have the one where one hummingbird is sitting still and the other hummingbird is just going into a horizontal flight back and forth. We saw in the video the tail spreads. So when the hummingbirds were sitting and they were just fanning their tails out, also believed to be aggressive and aggressive behavior, but also potentially for courting the females and attracting them. There is so much to learn and there are so many just fascinating different flight patterns that I hope you'll get to see this spring. Well, we didn't just see the red ruby-throated hummingbirds in Kentucky. There were some rarities that were seen over the years. Uh, the rufous hummingbird has been sighted more than a few times, while the black-chinned hummingbird has been seen once, and it was it was more of an accidental um, sighting. So to tell you more about this rufous hummingbird, uh, if you look at the map, you'll see that it's very much a Western species. Birds sometimes end up in weird places for a whole wealth of reasons, including storms and, and just random events that, that will lead them to somewhere that's not usually their range. They, so rufous hummingbirds are extremely rare summer, fall, and winter visitors. They have been sighted over a dozen times in Kentucky. Most recently, actually, this year, this February, in Marshall County. And we have the black-chinned hummingbird, who's also a very Western species. Nothing to do with Kentucky, but it has been seen once in McCracken County in 1998, which was probably very fascinating for the person who saw it. All right, I wanna see if people have some questions before we go, move forward to the backyard tips. Uh, Lisa, do you, do you think there are some, some questions out there that I can yeah, answer? Um, yeah. Tamara had some good ones. Um, when we were talking about nesting, she asked if the hummingbirds return to the same area to breed each year. And then she wondered, uh, do they remain in a particular area during the summer or do they travel around uh, during breeding and then along the same lines, and I can repeat these, uh, she was curious about whether uh, after the female lays her eggs, you mentioned that the males didn't hang around, do they go on and mate with other females or what, what do we know what they do? Yeah, so I definitely know the answer to the second one. Yes, the males will go on and mate with other females. There is no like long lasting uh, coupling that, that, that happens. It's just kind of very instant and then the female will go take care of the nest and the eggs and the male will just continue mating. It's just kind of how it is. Uh, for the first question, I'm not very sure of the answer, uh, but I will um, try and get back to that and um, give you an answer at the, at the end or after this webinar. I'm not sure exactly if they are faithful to, like if, if you've seen them once somewhere in a year, will they come back to the same area? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Are there other questions? Uh, that was it. I mean, I think the first two are kind of tied together with about staying in the area over the summer and then do they um, travel around. So as you said, you're, you'll look a little bit more into that. And then we've got, uh, do they return to the same area each year as long as the food source is there, which is a similar question. Similar and question. again, um, I'm not sure if we know that. <laughs> yeah, we, we will find out and let you know. Oh, well, here's someone makes a comment who, um, Claire has been to a hummingbird festival. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, and there was some bird banding. And according to Claire, um, the staff there mentioned that um, they would record the same bird multiple years in the same place. So apparently we had our question answered for us. So thank you, That's Claire, for that information. Yeah, thank you, Claire. That's awesome. And I wasn't exactly 100% sure, but yeah, I mean, that's 
really great to know. Um, and if for people, for those of you who don't know about this hummingbird festival, this is something that happens in the land between the lakes, and um, it's it's an amazing an amazing festival. And you get to see people banding hummingbirds in front of you, and you'll learn a whole lot about how that's done. So there's a live demo there. I, I'm not sure if it's actually happening this uh, this year, but hopefully next year it will definitely be happening. All right, thank you for your awesome questions. Uh, let's talk about how to attract these little beauties to your backyard, which is probably what everyone everyone is the most excited about. Um, so there's a lot to say about just the type of feeder that you have. There are good and bad types of feeders. And when I say bad, it's it will still function, but it's not ideal. So on the left side, you have, first of all, this feeder that has a top entry. And on the right side, you have a, a feeder that goes in from the side, where the, the birds will go in from the side. Why is it that the top entry is ideal? That's because when you get this top entry feeder on the left, it will not attract wasps and, and ants. Why? Because when it's at the top, only the hummingbirds can actually reach the nectar. It's so far down and with their tongues, they, they actually can get there. With the one on the right, it's very easy for, for wasps and ants to just crawl in there and actually be able to get to the nectar because the nectar is almost, almost so, it's almost so close to the, the opening. And so it's very easy to, to attract just pests and unwanted visitors. Both of these uh, feeders are red, which is the ideal color. But if you look on the right, this is not necessarily a feeder specification, but there is actually tinted water in this feeder and it's totally unnecessary and actually harmful to the birds. As long as your feeder color is red, you're good to go. You don't need to tint the water. Uh, the hummingbirds will find your feeder just because of its bright color because they usually um, will feed uh, on the nectar of red and orange flowers. Those are the most attractive flowers. They feed on the nectar of other flowers as well, but the red and orange is definitely the best color to have on the outside of the feeder. There's no need to tint the water. So you, when obviously when you're going to buy a feeder, you need to think about these things and ask yourself these questions. But for me, the most important question to ask yourself before you buy a feeder is, are you committed to feeding hummingbirds? It's a lot of work and we'll talk about the cleanings and you know, what you need to do and what type of effort and time you need to put in this task. It's, it's a great thing to be able to attract these hummingbirds, but it's also, there's, um, um, there's, a, there's a balance between you know, seeing these beauties and also spending the time and effort to make sure they don't get sick. So to fill your uh, hummingbird feeders, you need about a four to one ratio of water, water to sugar. So that means a quarter cup refined sugar and one cup water. Why do I say refined? Uh, Organic sugar actually has a lot of iron content and that can be toxic to birds. It's not toxic to us, obviously, but just this, this uh, difference in iron content is significant for them. So definitely always use refined sugar. And as I mentioned before, there's no need to use tinted water. It is worse than using just normal uh, clear water. When you have a hummingbird feeder, it has to be cleaned and refilled with fresh sugar water every two days. So this is obviously a big commitment and I personally do not have the time to refill uh, feeders every two days. I have seed feeders for seed eating birds and that is a commitment of cleaning once a week. That is something I can handle. So just think about what you can handle and, and see if you're able to commit to this task. You can definitely use ant traps to prevent ants from going into your, your feeders. That's, that's uh, definitely recommended. And I want people to know that the hummingbirds 
will migrate back south where they're supposed to be. Even if you have your feeders out, they will not hang around uh, more just because there's a food source. They will definitely know when it is time to return. So don't feel like you are you know, confusing them or just disorienting them. Your feeders are there and they will do what they they need to do, you know, regardless of the presence of that food source. So don't don't worry about that. Just stay committed to your cleanings, and and you'll you'll enjoy the hummingbirds as long as they want to be uh, there. They have plenty of natural food sources, and they also will continue to survive without feeders. So if you did have a feeder at some point, and now you don't don't feel like you know you're uh, cutting them off or something, there are plenty of uh, flowers that they can just uh, get nectar from. So this is just information for, for you to consider if you're interested in feeding hummingbirds for the first time. You may be veterans here and you're already uh, veterans of, of feeding hummingbirds and you probably know all of this, but this is just for the, the newcomers who are very interested in feeding hummingbirds. There's, um, before I go into the native pl plants, um, I wanna show you a really cool resource. So you may be asking yourselves, well, I, um, are you able to see my screen, Lisa? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, so, uh, sorry. So you may be asking yourself, well, I don't wanna put a feeder and have to uh, clean it every two days. What are the other ways that I can attract hummingbirds to my backyard? Well, if you're a gardener, then there's an answer for you. Um, it, it may be more commitment depending on your liking or it may be less commitment because you're an amazing gardener and, and this is something you enjoy. So there's this amazing resource called the Audubon Native Plants Database. And you can go there and enter your zip codes, and I'm gonna enter uh, the Frankfurt zip code right here. And so when you're wondering, all right, well, what plants do I need to get to attract hummingbirds? There is an exhaustive list here that will help you decide what to get. And it actually lets you select what types of birds you want to attract, and it will give you the types of flowers that you need to get. So, See, as you see here in the top, there's, best, there's 106 results for my area. And this here says all types of plants. You can select your types of plants that you want. And you have plant resources and the type of birds. So since we're talking about hummingbirds, I'm gonna select hummingbirds here. And the list is gonna narrow down a little bit. And it's such a wonderful resource and you can just literally pick out and learn about every single native plant that you can get for your area. So I hand selected a few of these to show you. And we're definitely encouraging native plants. We, we don't want to get invasive plants. And for, for, for kids maybe listening, what is an invasive plant? It's, it's a plant that is not necessarily from this area and it's, it, it's from somewhere else that it, it maybe landed here in, for example, Kentucky or North America by some sort of accident, human accident. And uh, these invasive plants not only are, are just uh, exotic, but they also grow very fast and they just compete with all the other local plants. They kind of take over the, all the local native biodiversity. So why is that bad? It's be bad because there are you know, insects and birds that rely on native plants and have been used to them for thousands of years. So bringing in invasive plants is something that disturbs just the, the order and balance of things. So you definitely don't want to, uh, I highly encourage you to not plant non-native and invasive plants in your backyards. It is always just better to use native plants. So cypress vine, a beautiful flower, unfortunately it is non-native and it can be invasive. And it's actually detrimental for, for you because it might actually take over your, your whole fence. It makes a lot of fast growing vines 
and it, it could just take over um, a large portion of your backyard. So let's talk about the actual native plants that are just as beautiful as this last one we saw. We have the cardinal flower. We have the butterfly milkweed, beautiful orange flower, and fire pink, the red columbine, and we have the trumpet creeper, which is a vine. Another vine, this is, a, now we're gonna talk about a tree. The red buckeye actually can attract hummingbirds. We also have some, I mentioned that we have, you know, the most attractive ones to hummingbirds are red and orange, but there are other, you know, great nectar uh, flowers that you could plant. So there's the foxglove, beer tongue. There's the cup plant. There's the wild blue phlox. This is something I see a lot on my hikes, just in the wild. It's beautiful. There's the cross vine. The red bud, which is just very common and widespread. You probably already have one in your backyard. And there's a whole lot of other plants that I didn't mention here. And I highly encourage you to go and just look at this database, depending on your zip code, and um, just find, find the plants that you might like to plant in your backyard. And this is this uh, that is all for today, but I definitely want to hear more about what you thought and and your que the questions you have about feeding hummingbirds. And I put it, put here the link to this native plant database as well as the link to the native uh, the hummingbird festivals and events. This link has the Kentucky event as well as other events in the nation. Um, if you're really uh, starting a garden of native plants, you can get your uh, plant seeds from your local Wild Birds Unlimited store. They also have hummingbird feeders that look like the picture that we uh, were just talking about. So if you wanna dive into this, uh, the, this beautiful world of feeding hummingbirds, uh, the, these are some of the recommendations you can, uh, you can take. Um, Lisa. What, what's going on in the chat? Well, we have a, an interesting question from Robin and Robin, feel free to, to chime in either via the chat or, or with your microphone. You asked, do they have a preference to either shade or full sun? And I assume you mean do the hummingbirds prefer sun or shade placement of the feeder. I assume that's what you mean. Yes, for feeding. Um, I'm not aware of that, nor could, do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't know exactly that there's a preference. Uh, all I know is that um, if you put them in the shade, it, it might just slow down the, you know, the growth of like, bacteria and, and things. So, I mean, the hotter it is, just the more regularly you have to clean those feeders. So if you put them in somewhere slightly cooler, I mean, that may help a little bit, but in the summer, that may not even make a difference. So I don't think there's a difference, but again, I'm not a hummingbird expert by no means. So I wanted to ask a question uh, that I had, I thought of as you were talking about the recipe for the nectar and then um, Claire has a question in the chat, but um, I, I had always heard the four to one as you mentioned, but I have heard that it's necessary to boil the water. Have you uh, found any information about that? Did you find that as you were researching? Uh, you can, I, you can boil the water, yes. It, I mean, if it doesn't dissolve immediately. Um, but I will look back into that. What I know is that you can, uh, instead of doing a four to one, mm -hmm. in, in the summer when it's extremely hot, you can increase the water ratio because they just need more water. You can make it five to one. Mm -hmm. so that's something I've uh, come across today and um, I'm not sure about the boiling. I think the boiling was just a matter of just getting the, the sugar to dissolve. I don't think it was uh, something that was specific to the hummingbirds. Let's see. Okay, thank you. Um, and Claire asked if there were any tips for feeding or attracting hummingbirds in small places like an apartment balcony or something like that. Where, wherever you are, uh, you can attract hummingbirds. So um, 
as long as you have, you know, the right feeder and the right, uh, you know, nectar, and you made the right nectar, if you have a little patio or just any type of outside space, they will come. So um, I, you don't have to have a backyard to attract hummingbirds. You, it's wherever you are. And um, I think, I hope she that she can um, get hummingbirds where she is. Yeah, I bet some flowers on the balcony would help. Some flowers. Speaking of flowers, and you mentioned that um, there are feeders and, and seeds at Wild Birds Unlimited uh, here in Frankfurt. I'm pretty sure this Saturday there will be a native plant sale at Wild Birds yeah. um, from Ironweed. And someone else uh, may be familiar and can correct me, please, if I'm, if I'm mistaken. But um, if that is the case, I know I got some plants from them uh, last year and they were lovely and reasonably priced and have come back uh, already this spring. So just a suggestion for folks who may be searching for native uh, plants for feeding your birds. That's really awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. And then before, before I forget, while maybe people are typing more questions, uh, just because, uh, you know, we're doing this today, it so happens that there's a freeze warning tonight. So if you already have um, hummingbird feeders outside, uh, just it's just a kind reminder that you might want to take them in for the night because they will probably freeze. Great point. And yeah. um, someone commented in the in the chat, um, Wild Bird, um, or, blah, excuse me, Wild Birds Unlimited, <laughs> Unlimited might have feeders that can attach to windows. And I'm pretty sure I have seen uh, at Wild Birds, um, Oh, good. Yeah, native plants 10 to 1 Saturday. Thank you for confirming. I didn't imagine that. Um, but I have seen um, curved curved hanging hooks where you could uh, attach to your house and it would curve out and you could hang uh, something outside of a window. So I, I do know those things exist. And of course, um, I would you know encourage folks to shop locally if they can. But um, worst case scenario, anything in the world can be found online, it seems like. Definitely. Yeah. And that's a great idea, Lisa, for like you were saying, if someone was in a, an apartment or in a small space, this is something you can easily put outside of your window. Were there any other questions? And folks, I don't have to read your questions. If you want to speak up, feel free. Um, yeah. Uh, We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I don't mind reading them, but if you if you wish to to be heard, feel free. Not not all at once, right? <laughs> Just kidding. I I'm so glad people actually ask questions. And uh, Diane, I think uh, I think we. Uh, I hope that we get more feedback from people maybe later and I will definitely send this presentation mm -hmm. and uh, the resources that I have uh, for, for you all to have. Well, thank you so much, Noor, and thank you, Lisa, and to the entire uh, Frankfurt Audubon Society. We appreciate you all so very much. This has been a wonderful presentation. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did record it. So uh, we'll be uploading that um, to the Paul Sawyer YouTube channel like we did the previous presentation. So if you happen to have missed that one, you can definitely uh, check that out. Um, but we'll have that uploaded in the next several days and then probably share that link on our Facebook page as well um, for anybody who would like to rewatch or, um, or share it with your friends that they should come check it out. So we'd appreciate that. Um, thanks again uh, to everyone who joined us tonight, and a thank you to our wonderful presenters. Uh, like Nora said, please let us know if you're interested in seeing more programming like this. Right now, we're still all virtual, but um, eventually we'll we'll be all back together again. Um, so either way, we we'd love to know if you're you're interested in more bird programming or really any any type of suggestions you have for programming. We always welcome those. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I, I wish you all a good evening and we hope to see you at another Paul Sawyer Public Library virtual program very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.